premier Christianity magazine. Are you fed up with fake news or bored of bad stories? We think it's time for something different. I'm Sam Hales, editor of Premier Christianity magazine. Every month, our team publishes stories of lives transformed, testimonies, miracles, healings, and loads more good news. We're here to encourage you, excite you, and keep you up to date with all that God is doing through His church. That's why we're proud to bring you a magazine that's different. For your free copy, visit premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Hello and welcome to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Megan Cornwell. This is the show where we delve into a person's life, faith and ministry. It's brought to you in association with the UK's leading Christian magazine, Premier Christianity. If you'd like a free sample copy of our latest issue, head to our website, premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Today on The Profile, I'm speaking to Father Nadim Nassar. Father Nadim is the Church of England's only Syrian-born priest. He grew up experiencing war and devastation and has committed his life to the pursuit of interfaith dialogue and peace. He is the founder of the Awareness Trust and travels the world speaking with Christians, Jews and Muslims. I spoke with Father Nadim in our London studio. Listen in. Father Nadim, on the profile, we'd like to start by asking you about how you became a Christian. So can you just share with us a bit of an insight into your faith journey? Interesting. I grew up in a, in a Christian family in Syria, which is a little bit unbelievable for the West, because <clears throat> when they, where everybody here, when they know I'm a Christian from Syria and a priest, the first question is, Father, when did you become Christian? Because they suppose that I was a Muslim and became Christian. So I go back and say, well, my family was Christian. And the second question usually is, your parents became Christian. No. A little bit back, it goes to St. Paul. And of course, the Jews drop and, and they look at me. What do you mean? Well, my mother was born in Antioch. And do you know what happened in Antioch? Christians were first called Christians in Antioch according to the Acts of the Apostles. And also, um, St. Paul became Christian on the road to Damascus. Surprise, surprise. Damascus is the capital of Syria. So <laughs> all this together makes me a natural Christian from Syria and normal, but not for the West. And I grew up in a very interesting family because my mother is Greek Orthodox. She's Syrian, but by denomination, she is Greek Orthodox. The biggest two denominations in Syria, Christian denominations, are the Syrian Orthodox, or the, Assyri the, the Syriac, and the Greek Orthodox. So my mother is Greek Orthodox, and my father was Presbyterian. The combination is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and not only Presbyterian, Scottish Presbyterian, because the Presbyterian church in my hometown in Syria, Latakia, which is a seaport on the Mediterranean Sea, um, was established by the Scots, Scottish missionaries. Wow. So I, I grew up one foot in the Presbyterian church, which is intellectual, um, the, the church is completely empty, nothing, not even the sign of the cross. Mm. And we always, um, I grew up singing the Psalms only. Where you, when you go to the Orthodox church and you put your foot in, and then you are faced with a festival of colors and, and icons and, and, and candles and, and chant and, and all this. So the contrast is amazing. And that was really enriching for me. So this is how I became Christian. A bit of Presbyterian influence, a bit of Orthodox influence, and also my time in Beirut. 
during the war. We'll definitely get on to that later. Yeah. Just just to talk about your faith, and it might tie in with your time in, mm. in Lebanon. Did you have a moment where you felt, yeah, this is absolutely real. I've inherited this wonderful legacy from my parents going back all of these of years. Course. But actually, there has to be really a moment in our lives, doesn't, doesn't there, where we say, I'm going to choose this way for myself did you have a moment like that or was it just always something that was part of your history and tradition and it just felt completely normal to you to believe in God it's interesting for me you said it has to be there has to be a moment when you say no I realize or recognize or I admit or I I confess or whatever actually it doesn't have to because the challenge in life sometimes and especially if you live in an area like the Middle East, it it can be that moment <clears throat> in the middle of bloodshed and war and pressure and uh, suffering, or the whole the whole atmosphere puts you not in one day, but puts you in front of choices. And those choices, as you make them, you increase your your um, direction towards God. It's not a moment. It's not a day, but rather the whole the whole trajectory of life. You need to 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 choose. For me, it was the biggest challenge in my life that. In the middle of bloodshed, where do I go? And I ask myself, if my faith doesn't make sense now, when should it make sense? So you lived through four wars, is that correct? That's true. So so what sort of impact did that have on your life and your faith? It shaped my faith. It shaped my life and reshaped it and reshaped it Mm. because... The longest period was Beirut, seven years in the 80s. And that was severe because I almost died several times. So I was very close to leave this life while I'm watching and not suddenly. So I I was threatened by a gun I was uh, shot at. Um, I could have been burned by by an RBG uh, rocket launch. I several times I could have died in Beirut, or an explosion next to me, or se- several occasions. Those occasions put you face to face with your mortality, face to face with your the question. What is the meaning of my life? What, what What is there for me? Why am I here? And when I graduated, I remember the first question I asked, not what is next. Why did I survive? I shouldn't be here, actually. So that's a lot of pressure for a young man. Yeah. I was very young. And did that push you into seeking your vocation and seeking what God wanted you to, to do with the rest of your life? I knew. And what was that? Peace building. It was, uh, it was tough tough decision but I knew it and you've gone on now to be the founder of the awareness foundation it's doing just that trying to build peace in the Middle East can you tell me a little bit about your work with that organization yes I love that region because of the suffering maybe because of the very special character that that region has uh the diversity of cultures, the diversity of religions, the diversity of worldviews, uh, the nature of the people there, the, the, the kindness, the generosity, the love that I shared in that region makes it very close to my heart. And also the constant suffering and wars that, that never ends in the, in the Middle East it makes the challenge amazing for me that still I want to contribute to the peace building, especially uh, now through the Awareness Foundation. We have, we have two big programs there. We have one program for the young people called uh, Ambassadors for Peace. We, we equip 
the the young adults and we um, empower them not only to stay in the Middle East because as you know the number of Christians is dropping rapidly and dramatically in the Middle East but also to have a meaning of their lives in that region to be actively peace ambassadors and actively peacemakers where they are mm -hmm. so they have a role they have a message not only just merely to survive and waiting for a visa to go where, wherever that visa takes them and the second uh, the second program is for the children uh, it's called little heroes whether displaced children or local children uh, as we all know children are the first and the worst victims of any war so a lot of children are traumatized they need their childhood back imagine a, a child in syria was born to 2010 now they are nine and they have seen nothing but war so what we do is through mentoring through gathering them through throughout the year and and following up with the churches to look after them and um, help them to find their gifts because children are not aware of their gifts. I remember I saw a child staring at uh, the, the area where we put painting stuff for children. And he was not listening to anything. He was not looking at anything. He was just staring at, at that area. And I came to him and I said, would you like to paint? He said, yes. So I said, come with me. So we went to that area. I said, have you painted before? He said, no. I said, have you colored before? He looked at me with a puzzle, puzzling eyes, big eyes, said no. I said, have you used any colors before? He said, no. I said, why do you want to paint? He looked at me, said, I don't know. I said, okay, go ahead. So he picked a brush, dipped it in a paint, and started painting. It was incredible. He never stopped painting the whole day. <laughs> and we were in a, in a shock to see that little thing coming alive just because suddenly he realized, this is what I want to do. This is Little Heroes. And that can, it can be as simple as that. Yes. And Father, over the time that you've been leading the Awareness Foundation, what one thing would you, or one program would you say you're most proud of? Both, um, or three. We, I'm very proud of Little Heroes, Ambassadors for Peace, and we used to have the Awareness Course, which is living in a global village. In a sense, there is no substance of, of materials that guide Christians without telling them what to do, what not to do. There is a lot of that. Christians do not need black and white answers. Christians need guidance on their journey, especially in the modern time. And, and Awareness Course was that guide. And we need, we are on the, in the process of revamping the course, especially, you know, the, the world has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Those three three programs I'm very proud of. So those programs, it sounds like a majority for Christians? And also for, for interfaith, because the awareness course we have always, in every session, a, a Muslim uh, uh, voice and a Jewish voice to tell us from their perspective what they think about that topic. For example, globalization, um, the, the, the scriptures, the role of the scriptures in life, um, um, the, the digital technology and revolution. What do they think from their own uh, religion, religious perspectives? What do they think about that topic? So it's not just us looking inwardly, but opening up and, and listening to other perspectives. And you're very passionate about that, aren't you? You are a real yes. advocate for interfaith dialogue. Yes. Why do you think it's so important to work with people of other faiths and beliefs? Because this is our destiny as human. I do not believe that God created us on his image, Christians first, or Jewish first, or Muslim first, or Buddhist first. He created us human first. Religion came after our creation and our values as a human. And also, it seems we are stubborn. We can't 
see the absolute clear, crystal clear message that God is giving us over and over and over and over again, that God's purpose in our lives and in the creation is to emphasize and highlight the importance of diversity. And we still, especially today, we still consider those who are, who do not share our perspectives politically, socially, uh, religiously, you name it, culturally, that they're wrong, I'm right. And I don't know what's going on in the world, but we are more polarized, we are more divided. Uh, the world is, is going crazy about that. And we are losing more and more the, this, this message of God that why do you want to be in a uniformity when I want you to be diverse? Look at everything. Everything is, is different. Why don't you celebrate that? But what about people who say, well, the scriptures talk about, you know, following Jesus and going the narrow road and Jesus being the way to salvation. Do you think that people who are following other faiths don't need to convert then? Good for them if they, if they are following Jesus. We are following Jesus. But I do not believe in the evangelism which aims to convert people. I, I believe in the evangelism which witnesses to Jesus. I don't want to convince anybody that Jesus is a savior. I want to show the world by believing that Jesus is a savior, what happened to me, the quality of life that I have, the joy in my heart, that deeper inner peace that I have, I want to share it with the whole world and, and show how wonderful it is to believe in Jesus Christ. But I want to present Jesus in my life rather than I live a pathetic life of, as a Christian and go and try to, to convert a, a Muslim or a Jew or a Hindu to, to, to Christianity. This is not what, what evangelism is. Evangelism is show me Jesus in you and let me see Jesus in me through you. This is evangelism for me. We're hearing reports from certain um, Muslim majority countries yes. uh, that, that people are having dreams about Jesus, that, yes. you know, m miraculous things happening. Are you hearing similar things from Syria? A flood of things. Can you share some of those stories? Yes. A lot of visions are happening. People are, are experiencing the presence of, of Jesus Christ um, in, in a way that I never heard before. Before you, you hear, you know, um, an icon um, leaking oil or something um, that the, the Virgin Mary, Our Lady appeared somewhere from time to time. But these days you hear visions, you hear people experiencing the presence of Christ in a way that never happened before. Uh, it's amazing. I think, I think that also due to the suffering, due to the, the heavy, heavy, heavy hearted, heavy hearts of, of people. People need to take a, 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 a breath of, of spirituality, a breath of meaning, a breath of hope. You know, this is what Christianity is about. I believe Christianity is about loving people in suffering and sharing with them a drop of hope, as if you are throwing a handful of water in the desert and hoping that those drops will be turned into a river. And they are turning into a river. So are you seeing people from other faith coming to, to Christ? Yes. yes. In, in, in large numbers? In, in a way that never, never happened before. It's astounding. 
And do you think that's because people are seeing um, the evil in fundamentalist Islam? Is that is that pushing them away from Islam? Do you think, or is it another? Re- is it for another reason? I think. I think fanaticism in every religion is destructive. Fanaticism in every culture, in every world view, is destructive because it it puts you in a cage. Fanaticism is a cage. And the person in that cage, I feel for them. I don't condemn them. I condemn what they do. And I condemn the hurt they cause for other people. But I pity them because this cage is not easy at at all. And we need to help them to break free from that cage. And sometimes whatever we do, we, we help. But the real breakthrough is when God becomes present in that cage and breaks it for them. And this is what what I feel the church is not doing enough. Here where we fail as a church to give Jesus Christ the liberator to the world and and give, give him as a symbol of freedom You know the truth and the truth will set you free. But Jesus said, I am the truth. And also, if the Son sets you free, you are indeed free. Those three verses complement each other to present Jesus as the free symbol and the liberator for those who are in those cages of 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 um, fanaticism and and um, which annihilates the other and puts the other as a target. I know somebody who lives in London. He is a wonderful man who was training to be a militant Muslim. Experienced Jesus Christ's presence in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and he used to go to Iran to. Um, to be trained and and he he wanted to convert all Christians into Muslim into Islam and he was very militant and very close-minded until one day he he met Christ in in a in a miraculous way and broke all the barriers in in his heart and in his mind and now he is he's a dear friend i love him and uh, he is an evangelist here he's a he's a minister and also he has a phd in law to help young people who are vulnerable to to offend and he wants to help indoctrination yes yeah and he wants to help he is syrian and he uh, he wants to help the youth in Syria who are you know involved with with violence and talking about the war in Syria father it's current Syria is currently ranked as the second deadliest country in the world because of the civil war that's been raging since 2011 do you feel anxious for your own safety when you're traveling back and forth safety is a very relative word <laughs> do you think we are safe in london uh Am I safe to cross the pond on a on an aeroplane? Um, am I safe in New York or Minneapolis or Beirut or um, safety is is something I don't even I stopped thinking about safety since 1981 in Beirut because it doesn't mean for for me it sounds absolutely crazy but it doesn't mean anything. What it mean for me? What the meaning? In, is in the mission that I'm going to, to do wherever I go. Of course, I'm not crazy to, to throw myself in an in a unnecessary, risky fires. But at the same time, what you do is you do. And you leave it to, to that, him. <laughs> that's very interesting because I think you can people can go two ways when they've been in experienced very traumatic situations like war and, and battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can either go the route of P- PTSD and, yes. and trauma and trauma. problems. Yes. Or, I mean, like you're saying, you, you've almost overcome the fear of death because you've been so close to it. I remember uh, 
St. Paul when he said, I have a desire to be with Christ, but being with you now is, is better. Uh, for me, is the same. The desire to be with Christ is overwhelming, but as long as he has something for me here, I'm here. And Father, how do you nurture your, <clears throat> your, your relationship with God and your faith so that, you're, so that you feel that zeal and that you haven't lost that zeal and that passion from all of those years ago? Mm-hmm. Is that just a mercy that God has bestowed on you or is it something you actively try to nurture every day so you don't become apathetic and you don't become cynical? It's a wonderful question. You know, if we bring a blind person from birth into a pitch black uh, room and we give give this person his or her sight back, would anything change no it's a pitch black room but now let's open the door to the sun or the window let's open the window for a fraction of a second and close it again and take his sight away again what did you do to him to this blind man you showed him a different way. Yes, but you destroyed him. Because that fraction of a second, he would never, ever forget. And he would seek that, that ray of light all his life. And he will live on its memory to the moment of his death. And... I have seen all uh, those glimpses of light, of grace. And those glimpses are atomic energy in me that never, never sees, never stops, never dry out. That fuel my passion and my life constantly to go wherever I'm led by his grace. That brings us to the end of part one of today's show. But join us again to hear more from Father Nadim Nassar right after this. Premier Christianity magazine. In this month's issue, we invite leading scholars to unpack the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth and explain why we can have confidence in these stories. Plus, we speak with the indomitable Anne Widdicombe ahead of the general election and explore our alternative Christmas gift guide with ethical and sustainable gifts for all budgets. All this and more in December's issue. For your free copy, visit premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Megan Cornwell, Deputy Editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the monthly magazine that sponsors this show. If you would like a free sample copy of our latest issue, just go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. But for now, time to rejoin my interview with Father Nadine Nassar. Listen in. And to talk about (coughs) sort of the war again, Father... Some people are saying that Syria is better off, better off under the control of President Bashar al-Assad because without his tight control, fundamentalism in the form of ISIS and others would reign in the region and Christians would face attack and oppression. What's your view on that? No one, no single human being, whoever that single human being is, could be the safety of a, of a country. The safety of a country when we build a system, a political system, a social system that protect that country. Can you say now the prime minister in Britain protects the country? Or the queen put protects the country? You can't say that. What protects the country is when you have the rule of law, when you have a parliament functioning parliament when you have when when the people have a say in how their life sh- should be run so whatever position you have against or pro 
the president as a president in Syria, whoever that president is, that president as a person should not be what, what we seek. What we seek in Syria is that a system that stops corruption, that restores law, that um, starts building up Syria again and give the people the security they need that the institutions of, of, of Syria are functioning. And that's what, what ruined Iraq. Because after the invasion, the British and the Americans, they dissolved all the, the, the institutions. And, and the, the, the whole country went into chaos. Because of that, I say in Syria, it's not just change the regime. Everybody is, is about changing. Changing to what? Before we, we, we rush to, to change and to... Yes, we all want to change. We all want, want a system that secures change of, of people whenever the people elect and, what, and respect that. So I'm not pro or against a human being. I am against any power that doesn't, uh, that, that is not or is beyond the power of the people. So, so you, you're looking for a democratic Yes, but, but democracy is, is a very dangerous uh, word because democracy is not something ready-made, you apply it. I, I always have a, an analogy for, for democracy, is like water. Water, it takes the shape of the pot. So I have in this mug water. The water is taking the, the shape of the mug. If, if, the, if the water is um, um, a cube of ice, I couldn't have put it in that shape. So democracy should be um, flexible in shape and emerges, it should emerge from, from the shape of the society. We can't take the, the, the British democracy which is different from the French democracy or the American democracy and apply it in Syria or Iraq. It doesn't work like this. And people would reject it because they <coughs> see it as a sort of... Foreign. Colon- exactly. And something imposed on them, rather something they, they aspire to, to, to implement and to enjoy. Yes, I want a parliament, but a parliament which looks like Syria which doesn't look like Britain or, or France or, or, or the US or Russia. No, I want a Syrian parliament that is unique to the society of Syria. And what do you think is the solution for peace in Syria? We have to, uh, to see the shape of the problem in order to see the shape of the solution. The shape of the problem is a proxy war. A proxy war means a war that involves many powers. So America is involved, Russia, Britain, Europe, um, Saudi Arabia, Iran, you name them. All of them are involved in in the war in Syria. So we need an international initiative that there would be an international will to find a solution for Syria, that the Syrians should adopt it and find themselves uh, comfortable with it. At the moment, I don't see that the international community has the will to solve the problem in Syria, which is very sad for me. And, and, and it's very upsetting. Do you have any opinion on what that solution could be? How, that could, how peace could be brought about? Yes. Um, I, I do believe that there should be, I used to, I used to say, the, there should be a dialogue the, the, uh, involved Syrians, Syrian-Syrian dialogue. Later, that is not, not necessary because when there is a ceasefire, the ceasefire is not announced in Syria. It's announced either in, 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 uh, in Moscow or in Washington. So it, that, that leaves the people of Syria out. So I think there should be an international peace conference be, um, 
my shape of this conference in my head is the first day is for for the press because i know the press is very keen to to know the shape of that but then the press is out and behind closed doors to end the suffering of that country because we have not seen such destruction in syria and such devastation since the 12th century and it's the biggest human disaster since the second world war and it won't end before all those who are involved sit around the table and find a solution and how have you felt father seeing your fellow countrymen women and children literally dying to find refuge in the West. How has it felt to see those pictures and read those stories in, in our newspapers here? I saw Christ being crucified again and again and again, every day. It seems we forget easily that those people are human beings with stories. Those people are doctors, engineers, designers, IT specialists, economists, writers, artists, musicians, fathers, mothers, left families. They had life we could envy for. And we look at them as objects. We dehumanize them in order to reject them. We have in the world 60 million refugees. I ask, where is Christianity? Where is the church? Those are not objects. Those people came out of good homes. Those people loved their children as much as we love our children here. They went to schools and universities. They fell in love and they risked everything exactly like did, like Raj did. He risked everything to come to us. When I reject one of them, I'm rejecting Christ. Has your faith been shaken at all by what you've seen in Syria? Yes. Can you talk a bit about that? <sighs> Doubt is organic part of faith. When somebody tells me they have faith without a doubt, they scare me because there's something wrong in that faith or something um, dangerous. So for me, my friend Bishop Michael used to say, doubt is the ants in the pants of faith. It it keeps you uncomfortable in your faith. And faith should disturb us, should stir us, and should fill us with joy. This is the paradox of faith. And as long as we are aware of that paradox, we rejoice in that. But if we want one part and reject the other part, or one face and reject the other face, won't work because it becomes dangerous. It sounds like you have a very healthy attitude towards doubt. Oh, I embrace my doubt as much as I, as I embrace my faith. You talked briefly about the role of the church, Father. What do you see as the role of the church specifically in this conflict? And has the UK church done enough? Don't get me started. East and West, we have failed big time big time. Yes, there was a lot of giving. Money, clothes, um, um, humanitarian aids and all this. But this is not all that the church can do. Yes, that is important and we are very grateful. But on the level of taking a position, challenging, standing up for injustice, standing up for suffering, no. We failed. 
big time. East and West, we were not what Christ would have expected from us. No, far from it. And I am happy to say that in the face of any Christian leader in the world. Are there any specific Christian leaders that you felt took a back seat? All of them. What about Pope Francis? He's been quite outspoken. It's not enough. It's not enough to be just, you know, pray for... for um, those who are in um, in suffering or in the war or have a statement here, a statement there. No, no. What do you think they should have been doing? They should have stepped up their challenge to the governments. They should have met and asked and demanded answers. They should have organized movements. I would have, if I was the Archbishop of Canterbury, if I was the, the Pope, I would have completely, I would have reacted completely different. What are they doing for Yemen? Yemen is a human disaster. And we, we here in this country, we sell still weapons to Saudi Arabia. Yemen is a threat to Saudi Arabia? It's a joke. Saudi Arabia is killing the Yemenis. What for? Because they want to fight Iran inside Yemen. Why, th why should the Yemenis pay, pay the price? Why should the Syrians pay the price? Why should Iraq pay the price? Because Saudi Arabia and Iran are not friends. And who said that all the Sunni should report to Saudi Arabia or all the Shia should report to Iran? This is ridiculous. I know many Shia and many Sunni who reject that but they can't say anything. Where is the church? Where is the church to stand up against injustice and say enough is enough, enough suffering, enough weapons? But all, all after, after all, everything is about the economy. Everything is about the dollar. Well, we just had a big arms fair in London, didn't we? I know. Within the last few days, exactly. And there was there were some there was there was a church presence there in it in terms of protests, but I don't think I heard anything from who who the would hear, who would hear about that? How many bishops stood up against this this fair? Do we know how many trillions of dollars we spend the whole world spend on 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 weapons and and military uh, equipment? If we put those trillions of dollars to build our cities and our, our villages and, and, and clean our, our climate and our air and stop the Amazon to, to be burned down, the lung of the earth and the oceans to be exploited in this way, we would have been in much, much more healthy and better way and can stand a bit with the head high in front of God. We have destroyed earth and we are destroying it every single day. And the church is sliding away as if nothing is happening. A, a, a conference here, a paper there. Where are the leaders to stand up against the climate change, against wars that are sweeping many countries in the world? Do we need wars in, in 2019 to solve our conflicts? Haven't we uh, learned anything from Jesus Christ after 2,000 years of books of theology and volumes of interpretation of the scriptures and endless conferences on peacemaking? Haven't we learned anything to offer the world and say there is another way, yet more excellent way, as St. Paul says, to solve our conflicts than war and conflicts and being supportive to the government when they when they bomb a country we need much more much more 60 million refugees in the world doesn't say a good word about the church i'm very critical but i acknowledge the good side of course we 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 need to encourage the good side of the church and and the giving and the the people who are paying their lives to help but on the level of of the pressure the level of of um, uh, doing something more substantial no 
We are failing. Absolutely. I told you, don't get me started. Father, to come on to something slightly different now, you are really passionate about your home country. That's very clear. And, you ha- and you're passionate about helping Christians in the West understand Jesus in his cultural context. Yes. And you wrote a book about this last year called The Culture of God. What motivated you to write this book? Ignorance. Ignorance about the roots of our faith, especially in the West and in the East, but especially in the West. I just came back from uh, the, the Festival of Preaching and most of, of, of the sessions that, that I attended spoke about Christianity, but actually what they meant was Western Christianity. But of course, is there an, any other Christianity in the world? So they assumed that this is Christianity. So when I gave my, my session, suddenly there was, it was a shock for the people that, no, Jesus was not born under Big Ben and was not born under Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which is in Palestine, which was a satellite of Syria in the Roman Empire. I remember when I wrote my book, a priest wrote to me on Twitter, N, capital N, with the 10 O's. No, Jesus was not Syrian. Well, I thought if, if, if a, a normal Christian wrote it, I understand. A priest? No? On what basis? No. Do you know your, your, your scriptures? What about um, Luke 2.2? 2? I just answered Luke 2.2, 2, which, which says, when Corinius was the governor of Syria. Why would, Paul, uh, would Luke mention the governor of Syria in the, um, in the story of, of, of the birth of Christ? And Luke was not an idiot. He was a doctor, a traveler. So, ignorance. And, and we need to re, rediscover the roots of Christianity in this country because most of the people in this country and in the West are embarrassed about their Christianity. And I tell them, yes, we are all embarrassed about some chapters of our church, not Christianity, church, history. Yes, East and West, we are embarrassed because the church is not Christianity. Sorry, we, we got it wrong many times in the church and we failed but does it mean this is christianity no it's not so i i want to scream and say to the people your roots of faith don't be embarrassed of of your roots of faith because it's not the institutional church it is jesus christ who was syrian syrian citizen and the more we unpack the culture of syria the more we we find the culture of the trinity the culture of love that Jesus revealed. What are some of the ways in which we've misunderstood Jesus? Can you give me any specific examples uh, of the way we've misunderstood Jesus by looking at him through a Western lens? Yes. Um, If you look at the image of Jesus, for example, it does affect our attitude to Jesus when we see Jesus as a blonde and has piercing blue eyes. (laughs) Well, Sorry to disappoint you. Jesus was not blonde and didn't have piercing blue eyes. So Jesus was rough, was dark haired and, and, and brown eyes and, and he was rough and, and he was a revolutionary man. So even on the level of the image of Jesus, we, this, this um, fluffy Jesus is a destructive image of, 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 of Christ. Christ was not fluffy. He was far from being fluffy. He he was a storm in the faces of the Pharisees. He was a storm in the faces of of the the, the, the religious leaders because he did not come to establish a religion. Here we, we, we all have accepted that Christianity is a religion. No, Christianity was never a religion. Jesus came to give us a way of life which leads to to God, and God is the center of it. He did not come to to establish an institution called Christianity and called the church, and and we we become members of it. But 
Of course, when we say, well, interreligious dialogue, interfaith dialogue, we have accepted because, you know, we have other religions. Well, if Islam wants to, to understand itself as religion, fine, good for them. But Christianity is not. But actually, the church is an institution, but the mosque is not. Although Islam is the religion and they understand uh, Islam as a religion, we, we shouldn't, but we have the institution. So all that muddles the Middle Eastern Christ who was on one hand the king of kings, the challenger, the revolutionary, and on the other hand he was the loving, the giving, the healer, the, the, the counselor. And when, when we combine the two, we, look, we are looking at an extraordinary man. But unfortunately, people have run away from the church because we are not reflecting the true image of, of Jesus who came from the Trinity, from the culture of love, the culture of the Trinity, and revealed all that passion of God in his own culture. This is what we are missing. From everything that you're saying to me, your frustration with the institutional church is really, really coming out. How on earth did you become an Anglican priest? <laughs> For my sins. <laughs> well, I chose to be Anglican because I chose a platform, let me put it that way, a platform that I can, you know, being Anglican has given me the opportunity to speak out. Not, I mean, I'm not against the church in any way. The church is my mother. And I love my mother. But it doesn't mean I'm not critical to the institution. I'm inside. I chose to be inside because I want this balance of, of faith and, and, and mind of the heart, you know, in the West, Christianity is locked here. Our faith is very intellectual. Everything should go through logical uh, arguments and everything is locked here. In the Middle East, faith is, is in the gut. It's passion. But actually, faith is neither in the gut nor in the head. It is in the heart. We in the Middle East need to make the journey up, to meet the journey down to the heart. And it's a very difficult journey. And I feel belonging to the Anglican platform, I'm, I'm more able to set myself on that journey. But now, am I a Middle Eastern or a Western? Who knows? <laughs> But I'm trying to find that heart, which is the heart of, of the gospel, which is the person of Christ. Well, Father Nadim, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, sadly, that's all we've got time for here on Premier Christian Radio. But join us again next week. Same time, same place.